Welcome. My name is Robin Strasser, and I am a member of the Elders Advisory Committee, and I'm also a resident of the 48th Ward. I think I even have an alderman living in my building, although I never see him because I go out the back door with my dog. Little Brothers has been in Chicago for over 53 years, younger than most of us here today. Our mission, Flowers Before Bread, may sound a little sassy, but we believe in it, and we hold to it, and we carry it out with each and every interaction and action that we plan and take with our members and our guests. We ask you, as aldermen of the city, to join with us in helping Chicago's older citizens live friendship-filled lives. And for that, we all have a very strong concern. Jump in when you want, or I'm going to turn it over to somebody else who's going to jump in. And John and Pat is next. Anybody else? Francis. The Elderly Advisory Committee has been in existence for five years. Our purpose is for its members to give input and plan programs for Little Brothers. The Civic Engagement Committee has been around for one year. The purpose is for members to become more involved with their community through volunteerism and advocacy. So uh, my name is Simone Mitchell Peterson. I'm the CEO at Little Brothers Friends of the Elderly. And uh, I just want to kind of set the stage for this uh, meeting's format. What we're going to do is, is that uh, we will have a series of questions that uh, the respective members of uh, the committee will ask the alderman. We'll ask you to respond. And then at the very end, if we have additional questions from other guests and other members here, that they would also be given the opportunity to ask those questions. Our time today is brief, because we know the aldermen are very busy. So we want to try to keep this as close to an hour. We will be serving lunch. So if you're willing and able to join us, please feel free to do that also. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Angie. Angie is one of our program coordinators here and has been working with the Elder Advisory Committee members and Civic Engagement Committees to plan this event. Angie? Excuse me, um, we have a new guest. Great, welcome. So as we get started, as you can see from the agenda, we have about four different discussion topics. And the members of our committees have um, frame some questions for you all. So I'm going to turn it over to Robin. She has a question to kind of start the conversation, and it's about the legislative process. Well, one of the things we probably don't know individually is how the city council works. The days, the different committees that you have, the purposes that you assign yourselves, and then the directions that you follow from the mayor down to the different members of your committees and how you go about making our city livable for everyone. So if you have questions, we've got questions, and we'll take as little time as we can to explore them. I think we did want to give you, Alderman, an opportunity to introduce yourself, <coughs> and then maybe just give us a brief, how does the um, city How does work? the council work? How does the city, how does the city work? work? Right. My name is Rick Munoz, and uh, I'm, a member, I'm a member of the Chicago City Council, uh, representing the 22nd Ward. And the 22nd Ward is roughly comprised of the neighborhoods of Little Village and North Lawndale. And with, with redistricting, I also picked up the Vidham Park community. Uh, so it's uh, L Little Village and North Lawndale and Vidham Park over on the southwest side uh, of the city of Chicago. Uh, if I may, just kind of jump in and uh, give you a brief synopsis, a brief explanation of how I believe the city council works, uh, is that it's the legislative branch of the uh, municipal form of government. We have 19 committees. Each one of us serves roughly on five to seven committees, depending on, on our interests. 
Uh, and the way legislation gets uh, introduced is one of three ways. Either the mayor can propose a piece of legislation, any city resident can submit a piece of legislation or a proposal to the Chicago City Clerk, or an alderman can submit a piece of legislation. So it's pretty open in terms of if you have a proposal, if there's a uh, idea that you have to try and get it to, uh, placed into law. Now, I always joke that in the city council, on any given day, on any given city council day, we adopt roughly about 1,000 pieces of legislation. It's a lot. But most of that is perfunctory routine matters, like stop signs, one-way signs, uh, do not enter signs, uh, stop lights that need to be erected. Uh, all of those uh, are done by, by ordinance, and then also some land use ordinances, like zoning and plan developments uh, in how a neighborhood is supposed to grow. Uh, and on most of those, the home alderman uh, basically gets to decide, for example, whether a stop sign uh, goes up in a particular uh, corner. And the rest of us kind of respect that alderman's wishes uh, in terms of allowing them to basically uh, implement the legislation that they want for their wards. Uh, you do need 26 votes to have a piece of legislation adopted. So every now and then when there is a controversial issue, uh, when we introduce issues, we do have to lobby our colleagues and make sure that they agree with us to try and get something adopted. But the most important piece of legislation that we uh, consider every year is the Chicago City Budget, because it's actually an ordinance and that we pass in usually in November of the prior year for next year's uh, fiscal spending. And that is the one piece of legislation that does take up a lot of our time in the fall because we review the mayor's proposals on the priorities for the city of Chicago. So in a nutshell, that's basically how I believe uh, sometimes the city council works. Um, Rick pretty much hit, hit on everything. Um, one of the things with, um, with our infrastructure, we get a certain amount of money every year. I think is it 1.2 million? 1.4. 1, 1. 1.2. He says 1.4 million. He may get a little more than the rest of us. <laughs> How you get more money than us? Because I'm the 26th ward. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we get we get 1.2 million dollars of um, what we call a menu, uh, and 1.2 million dollars is not a whole lot of money. But every ward, all 50 wards, get 1.2 million dollars to do things like um, um, repave the streets, fix the sidewalks, uh, do curbs. Um, we use it, now they use it, they try to use it just about for everything. Now, now they use it if you want to get the police lights up, you have to use your menu money. You want to get the, the alley repaved, you use your menu money. If you want to get speed humps, <laughs> You use your menu money. What else we use it for, Reggie? And this is Reggie Stewart. He's my infrastructure guy. Uh, that's about it, Reggie. Yeah, I covered everything. So, so you use your menu money for all of those things. Now, uh, sometimes, uh, like for instance, we got a situation where uh, residents want something done in a the park. They want a playground in a park district over at Eckhart Park in our ward. <coughs> and so they ask. Uh, us, if we can, and, and these, you know, people in the neighborhood get kind of smart. They ask us, could we use uh, some of our menu money to help to play, pay for the playground in the park? So, for instance, this year we're giving up a uh, hundred thousand dollars of our menu money to help to pay for the playground in the park because the park district don't have enough money, and the neighborhood is actually raising money themselves to get the playground fixed. So our menu money uh, is what we have to work with. The average street cost, just to give you an idea, and, and most of us, like my ward for instance, uh, roughly goes from almost Pulaski all the way to Clark Street, roughly North Avenue all the way to Van Buren. So there's a lot of streets, alleys, sidewalks in that area. Oh, and I forgot, also we use the, uh, the menu money for lights. If you want new lights, if you want the ornamental lights, the piggyback lights, all of those things come out of the menu money. But just to give you an example of uh, the average street to get repaved is what, Reggie, about 100? 45. And then uh, sidewalks on an average block is, for one block, is about $100,000. $100, so you divide that up and try to figure out how 
<clears throat> how much you can get done with that. And then a lot of people, when they when we put lights on the street, when everyone, once you do anything new, and I'll give you an example, once we started doing speed humps, once one block got speed humps, everybody in the neighborhood wanted speed humps because they saw because they saw one person get it, everyone wants. Once we started doing um, ornamental lights or those silver lights, everybody, every block in the ward wanted the silver lights, but they only give us like two blocks a year of, of, uh, of those lights to put up those silver lights with the piggybacks on. So we only get two blocks a year. And, and the cost of those lights, Reggie, is $125,000. So, you know, so we have to try to budget ourselves uh, in doing those kind of things. Also, uh, there's a, a situation, sometimes you're able to get some extra money if something is an emergency. They have a, uh, transportation has a little emergency budget that we can try and get some money out of if it's real dangerous, uh, like it's a hole in the ground, uh, we can try and get some money out of that. Uh, every once in a while, if, if don't nobody, if no one else beat you to the punch on trying to get that, <laughs> on trying to get that money, um, and then some of us, if we if we're um, if we have a TIF area, we're able to leverage some of that money, and that's a, a TIF is called Tax Incremental Financing District. Um, it's another way of funding a community. If you have money in the TIF, you're able to utilize that to do some of your infrastructure work. But basically, uh, the areas that don't have any special um, funding resources in them, they only can use the, uh, the menu money that you get from the city, which is 1.2 million. So if you divide, so let's say the average thing costs about $100,000. So you divide 100,000 into a million, what is that? Uh, Ten. <laughs> gone, gone, gone. Gone, quick, yeah. right? So, but then, so, so then this, I, this what happens to us. I, I don't know if it, it, it may happen the same way to my colleagues. So, we get our infrastructure in several different ways. One, um, residents have come to the office and asked for it. Residents will call and ask for things to be done, sidewalks, streets, speed humps, alleys, lights, all of those things. Um, and or we'll go out and we'll drive around and we'll see it and we'll see that it's real bad. Generally, um, uh, myself, what we try and do, we try to take who comes first in request first and then also we try to take what's worse first also. And so, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a heck of a balancing act to have to divvy out those little things. Um, they're not little to a lot of people, but it's, it's, it's a little, when I say little things, I'm talking about that money. It's not that much. It's a, it's, a challenging ba uh, it's a challenging balancing act trying to get it out there. And sometimes it takes a couple of years before you can get to a project, but we all try to do the best that we can. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon to all of you and thank you for having me to have the junior member of the city council. <laughs> um, I, I was appointed about four years ago, um, four and a half years ago by Mayor Daly um, when a vacancy occurred in my ward. Uh, and so prior to that, I did serve as a county commissioner for um, almost four full terms, 15 years. So. Um, and in February of 2011, I was able to uh, run for the first time um, in my ward as, uh, as um, alderman of the 26th ward. Um, my ward basically goes from Grand Avenue to the south, um, Armit uh, Palmer to the north, Western to the east, and Costner to the west. But I do have a little finger that sticks out east from Chicago to Grand, all the way east to Damon. So, but I, even though it sounds a little bit um, awkward by ward, I have one of the most compact uh, wards in the city uh, of Chicago, Remap. So I'm, 
I did not want to change anything of um, that. I didn't want to give up anything that I had from my old ward. Um, but I, we all have every 10 years, we have to go through this exercise of redrawing the boundaries of each one of the Aldermanic District and any other legislative district in the state and in the uh, and for federal legislative offices. That is pursuant to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that um, that mandated us to re to redraw those boundaries every 10 years so that protected groups in this country will have the opportunity of electing uh, one of uh, one of our own uh, give us that opportunity so because of that um, some of our constituents feel uh, not happy every time that we have to go through this process but we are required to do so um, so i don't think that i have to add anything to the legislative process because uh, i think that alderman uh, muñoz uh, was very eloquent in describing the whole process in terms of who introduces ordinance um, and how the process worked the only thing that i will add to that is that when typically when an ordinance is introduced is is typically re, uh, said or referred well, not typically, always is referred to one of the 19 standing committees of the city council so that the proposed ordinance can be heard in that committee. Uh, one is heard, and sometimes you, it only takes one hearing to take a vote at the committee level. Uh, then it comes back to the city council for ratification of that ordinance. And, and, and that, it, depending upon how controversial the ordinance is, it can trigger uh, a debate in the city council when it comes back for a final vote. Um, but typically, uh, most of the ordinances um, are debated and heard in committee, and, and sometimes it takes more than one hearing uh, so that members feel comfortable. And members who are not of the city council, who are not members of a given committee, they are welcome to come. And, and bring up their issues and their points, and they're a part of the discussion and the debate. The only difference is that members of the committee are called upon first by the chairman of that committee so that they can ask their questions because they're members of that committee, but then the other members that are not members of that given committee are free to ask all the questions that they want um, before a vote is taken. Now, and when the vote is taken at the committee level, only members of that committee can vote. And then it comes to the city council at large at the following city council meeting and a final vote uh, takes place. Um, in terms of the, the infrastructure uh, services uh, of this, um, by the city, uh, offered by the city to our constituents and residents, <clears throat> I will, add that in terms of the uh, the menu dollars that we have, I, I concur with um, Alderman Burnett. It sounds like a lot of money that each one of our city member councils do have to invest in infra infrastructure in our wards, but it's not uh, a lot of money at all. Um, it, like we heard, a, a street can go uh, resurfacing can cost between 45 thousand dollars to sixty five thousand dollars and that's you know almost is about eight percent of your total allocation and as you know we have many streets we have many streets that need those uh, replacement of light poles and those are even more expensive uh, to to lit a street um, and and if we want to do a a, uh, a traffic light to replace a traffic light uh, that is not within the overall and large or uh, macro plan of the city of Chicago, then that falls on the alderman's menu, and that may cost as much as $250,000. So, but by the way, this is one um, vehicle that aldermans do have to provide services to their to, to their uh, residents of the ward that, that to attend and pay attention to uh, infrastructure needs that the city would not even contemplate because it may not be in their long-term over macro plan so that if we have a need 
to, to resurface one street, but the city does not have it in plan until 10 years down the road, the alderman can decide to use their many dollars to do that now. And this was all started by, by, by Mayor Harold Washington. And in fact, in the 80s, when it became uh, prior to his, by the way, yesterday was uh, the, the anniversary of his first mm -hmm. swearing in uh, uh, um, uh, ceremony. And so a couple of years after he was sworn in that first term, um, he was the one who redirected funds to each one of the city council members uh, to invest in infrastructure improvements uh, in their given wards. So today's called menu. I don't know what was the, uh, how, how was it called back then, but I think, you know, uh, it's a little piece of history that it was started. Uh, thank thank you him. very much, all aldermen, because it, this leads right into some of our elders' questions on infrastructure. So mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Lily to... Uh, that was a nice way of coming. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so next on the agenda, we have Joan and Pat, who are going to talk a little bit more about the city services and just the infrastructure. So I'm going to pass it on to Joan. Okay, my name is Joan Robards, and I live in the 43rd Ward, which, well, it's pretty well kept, if I have to say so. <laughs> but anyway, um, our concern is um, about the, the uneven sidewalks. The, well, anybody can trip on the sidewalk if it's uneven. You know, uh, case in point, yesterday when I was going home, I crossed the street, Clark Street in order to get the diversity bus, and all of a sudden, whammo, I, was, I found myself on my face and my hand. Uh, I fell. Just a, I don't know what tripped me up, but there is a, an area there at, uh, on the sidewalk that is, uh, has undergone a little, um, uh, well, what shall I say? Uh, it, it's uneven <laughs> uh, to um, get to the point. Anyway, uh, so I fell. I haven't fallen for quite a long time, but when you fall at 88 years old, you know it's kind of serious. However, I was lucky. I hurt my hand and my knee, and I did fall on my face, but uh, you know, that can do with some alteration anyway. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, but you see, this, and about 10 minutes later, another woman fell almost in the same place, and she was younger than I. So you see, it's not strictly the province of elderly people. Uh, anyone can fall, but the point I'm trying to make is when you're elderly, you know, naturally you want to go out as much as you can because uh, walking is supposed to be good for you. Um, <laughs> and anyway, um, this, this could happen any, to anybody, but it's, uh, it's much more serious when, you, when you're elderly to fall because uh, number one, we don't, and, and we don't see very well, you know, many of us. So we don't see very well, and many of us don't pick up our feet uh, as we should, um, because you know they get heavier and heavier every year. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I've been fortunate in not having any really serious injuries that way. But I'll pass the mic on to Pat Patel, and um, she'll tell you about uh, a more graphic experience that she has had. Hi, my name is Pat, and I belong to Little Brothers Committee. In 2010, I was walking by a friend's house, and I cripped, cripped on some sidewalk, and it was really cracked. I went down, boom, I went down. It came so fast. Um, I had shoulder surgery from it. In 2012, I had to have another surgery because of my shoulder, and my shoulder won't be the same. Um, I just, when I just was walking, and all of a sudden down, I went kaput, you know? And um, I go to different places and I watch a different, because I crack sidewalks all over the place, especially in Michigan Avenue by Bloomingdale's or when you're going around the corner to go to therapy. I've never seen so many cracked sidewalks in my life, you know? And uh, I just, uh, I went through a bad experience. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. 
because uh, I had the shoulder surgery done the second time and uh, I, my, my shoulder won't be the same. So. Yeah, so anyway, um, I, did, I presume has been considered, but it, it, yeah. it, it is a serious problem. Uh, and um, I, I, well, it should be addressed. <laughs> That's uh, that's the only uh, thing I have to say. However, as you pointed out, these things are very expensive. To, uh, but when it's a, a very well-traveled street and a, you know a place that gets a lot of traffic, I think it should be you know taken into consideration mm -hmm. uh, because it's even hazardous for people with wheelchairs. If the sidewalk is broken or uneven in any respect. Yeah, so now I'm going to pass it on to Connie. Connie, go ahead. Okay. You're going to talk. All right. Uh, my name is Connie Solano, and I'm, um, as I could see, my alderman is here, 22nd Ward. Okay. I've uh, been there for about over 30 years. 20 years I've been uh, judge of election. I knew him when he had black hair when he first started. <laughs> uh, now, we're aware that we can call 311 for emergency services, but as older adults, we are concerned about the lack of enforcement of law and impact that quality of our lives. For me, as my, I'm, I'm not as young as I used to be, and at a time of snow, I clean my sidewalk. And then I go to the business district, and one out of four have not. It's hard to walk in the snow, and it's hard to walk in someone's footsteps who have walked there before because they got longer steps. Mines are shorter and closer together now. And when I wait for the bus, I know some people that have tried to clean off the snow, but why on the corner do they pile it up where I have to wait for the bus? Who's, who's, who's supposed to clean that spot? The bus people or the owner of the corner? I stand on a corner where it's a bank. And they clean theirs to the sidewalk, but I cannot walk to their corner because it's all full of slush. And if it's a snoo snow, well, I can step into it and make my own footsteps. But if someone else has stepped there, I cannot. And I cannot walk in the slush. And if I have to walk out on the sidewalk, the bus might hit me instead of pick me up. And if I go to their corner close to the alley, both people of the clean their side had pushed the <coughs> snow into the alley, and people can't even cross to the alley, so they still have to go to the street. Now, who's responsible for something like that? And then sometimes I have to cross the street, and whoever has cleaned the snow has pushed it out into the street, so if it's, if, if it's a new snow, I can push it myself because it's light. But if it's hardened and made a mound, again, I cannot step in that mound because I'm going to fall either way. And I have tried to go to, on my own, buy those little army shovels and carry it with me, but I cannot no longer find those little shovels that they used to use for, to dig out. And if I'm going to have to do that, I'm going to do that, because I cannot stand waiting on a mound when I went across the street even. Whose responsibility is to clean the business districts? And I know. Some people, are, some people do have closed businesses, and yet they send people to clean their sidewalks. In fact, they do such a neat job that I cross the street to walk on that side. Now, whose ordinances is it? Who, who takes care of uh, enforcing the law to clean your, their, your sidewalk on business districts? Do you have an answer, sir? Well, uh, it is the property owner's responsibility to maintain their sidewalk clear. Uh, part of the challenge is that a lot of businesses uh, are, are not the owners of the property, and so then they just keep bouncing the ball back and forth on who's responsible. Can you speak up part of the problem is that uh, some of the businesses are not the property owners, so they kind of blame each other. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. for example, on 26th Street, uh, there is an SSA, uh, a special service area designation, that uh, this for the last two years has been paying for snow removal. 
and the challenge is that when the snow comes down, it takes them a little while to get to the whole strip. But hopefully uh, we'll be able to alleviate that and make it better for your safe walking. What do you call a little while? Because I have, I have time to clean my sidewalk and go down to the business district to do my shopping. It's in the afternoon and nobody has touched it. You know, I, I like to add a little bit more about that. Um, the other escape that many property owners do use is that <clears throat> is the issue about liability. If an owner cleans up the sidewalk in front of the business or their home uh, and somebody passes by and falls, it becomes the liability of the property owner. If or they don't clean. If they, if they clean oh. and once they clean, somebody walks by and fall, it becomes the liability of that owner of that property. If, for example, um, they do not clean and somebody falls in front of that you bring property, it to God. they're not liable. So isn't, isn't that a tricky situation? It's I mean, funny. Uh, it's, now, in terms of what he is suggesting of the SSA, the special service areas, uh, that's a wonderful thing for, for commercial strips. However, uh, you should know that the property owners uh, for that strip, the commercial strip, they pay an additional tax levy on their properties to be able to raise the money to pay for that, uh, for, for, for that crew that comes out to clean up and sweep uh, the sidewalks during the summer and clean up the, um, and, 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 and shovel the snow during the, um, during the winters. Um, so we, we, we do have an ordinance that um, businesses are supposed to clean up in front of their, property owners are supposed to clean up in front of their places in the business area. Um, so our only alternative to deal with that, to enforce them to do that, is to have someone to go and write them a ticket. They can get fined uh, for not doing that. So that that can be done. As far as as far as uh, with CTA, um, CTA usually shovels uh, around their around their bus yeah. stops. And also, uh, the city generally try to send people out to shovel around the fire hydrants. But if those things aren't happening, um, you know, you can call our office. We can call CTA, and we can. CTA is the one we call. CTA is responsible for taking care of their property. If you know that CTA is supposed to, uh, they clean up around their property. They're supposed to shovel around their property. They're supposed to. Uh, in some instances, like around the L stations, they empty the garbage around the property. Sometimes you see around the L stations, you'll see a guy outside sweeping around the CTA um, stairs and everything. But they don't work for the city, they work for CTA because that's their property. But we can also work with them also. I mean, if, uh, if uh, you have a challenge in, in, in and we can't get anyone to attend it, we will have somebody from our office to come and try and attend it for you. So. Give me the number. I am willing to call. Well, but not over in the, I can't go way over there, though. <laughs> you, call, you call me, Connie. Uh, call <laughs> you do it. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Connie. My name is Hollis Devonport, and I want to tell, I want to say to all of them, Burnett, I'm from the second ward, but I'm, I used to be in the second ward. I'm in the 28th ward now. But I used to enjoy those affairs in the park. Back to school and the senior affairs you used to have. Oh, so you were in park. the second ward, but you still used to come to my I events. used to come. I used to come to them <laughs> and enjoy to, them. You all go to everybody's events, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay, my question is about transportation on CTA. I see the new system that they're putting in. I'm trying to find out about they're going to put a station in the middle of the street where you would have to pay to get on the bus. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be uh, the bus driver will not be taking uh, the bus cards and the fare anymore. Just you have to pay before you get on the bus. So, uh, Mr. Hollis, um, 
they are still going to have hearings in regards to this. So there's no there's no final decision on it. I mean, they 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 have a final decision to do it on Ashland Street. Right. That's that's final. But how they do that on Ashland Street and and how is 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 set out, uh, they're they're still having hearings about that. It's just like over here in this area, because this is where it would affect me and my ward. Over here in this area in our ward. You know, we still have some concerns from businesses who don't want the left turn lanes taken out. Uh, they agreed to let the parking stay because we were concerned about parking. So there's still some issues that's to, that's to be worked out. So I would advise you and other people that you know, whatever concerns that you have, we need to make sure that you know about the hearings that are going on so that you can come to the hearing and you can express yourself and tell them what you're concerned about. And if you want, um, uh, Mr. Hollis, you can give us your information, and once we find out about the hearings, we can let you know about the hearings, and, and we can try to deal with CTA together. Because I have some issues with some of this rapid, they just threw it on us, this rapid thing. They had hearings, and we told them we didn't agree with a lot of things, and they still put it in, so we still have to work on it in the hearings to get them to... Uh, to get them to be able to, if they want to do this, they have to not interrupt uh, people's livelihoods. Okay, I have one more question. Usually when I'm getting on the bus or on the bus, I see people with strollers and uh, carts, and you can't hardly move when you get on the bus. Like everybody stops at the front of the bus. I got on the bus yesterday, there was two strollers and here's a wheelchair, which the wheelchair is good. And, and you can't hardly move. And my mind went back to 19, in the 50s. People that was born in Chicago in the 50s, no, was living here in the 50s, no. At 63rd and Ashland and, and State, a bus hit a gasoline truck. Oh, and everybody died on that bus because they couldn't get off. And I thought, I was thinking, I said, the way they got this bus jammed with all these strollers, people would never be able to get off this bus. And, I, and the bus driver seemed like, come on, come on, don't care how many, he just putting them on and just jamming the bus with strollers. And I think that's very dangerous. So, Mr. Hollis, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate those comments, uh, and it, it does sound dangerous. Uh, CTA have hearings. Uh, not not the hearing I was talking about earlier was just about this this uh, new rapid transit project, but they have hearings every month, if I'm not mistaken, down at the CTA office over on Lake and Des Plaines, and it's open to the public, and you can go there anytime when they're having those hearings, and you can testify and you can express those things to them, uh, you know, because some people don't take these things and some people aren't aware of these things. And, and it's good to let them know uh, how it affects you and what you're concerned about. Uh, and, and maybe they can start talking to the bus drivers and making sure they make sure if there's room for the, for the, uh, the lane to be clear, uh, that they should make it clear. So, so I, I would advise you to either go down there and we can mention it to CTA also that we got a complaint about that. We can call uh, the head of CTA and let him know that we did get a complaint about that. And then also, I want you to know you're still welcome to come to our picnics anytime. You want, so. <laughs> the date of those um, hearings? Do we know the dates yet? No, they haven't. They haven't sent them yet? Not yet. I know that we are relaying those concerns, and I think that uh, the advice that Alderman Burnett gave to us about maybe looking to have a separate discussion at one of the forums with the CTA would be. Uh, probably the route for us to go because clearly not only, not only at this meeting but in other conversations that we've had there are a lot of issues around transportation. Uh, many of our elders do not own cars. It's the way in which they get out and, and live their lives and so um, we I think owe it to you um, to really make sure that we follow up on some of this. Okay. So we're going to be moving on our agenda and we have Melinda and Owen who are going to be talking a little bit more about public safety. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Melinda Smutek, and I'm from Ward 50. I'm here with my cohort, Mr. Owens, who's from Ward 
27, and Ms. Minnie and Ms. Donna from Ward 4. Our focus today, and we'll try to make it as brief as possible, gentlemen, is the issue of public safety. And um, Alderman Old Maldonado, I want to commend you for bringing to our attention uh, Mayor Harold Washington. Uh, if, if we needed a, uh, an advocate for the folks and an advocate for public safety, he was that advocate. But that's not to say, however, that our current Mayor Emanuel or the father and son Mayors Daly or Mayor Jane Byrne were not also for that because they were. But they were as functional and powerful because of you folks. Um, yes, you get a lot of flack from us out in the field <laughs> and phone calls and emails. But in our estimation, or at least in mine, you all are the sentinels. You are the ones who take our recommendations, hold the hearings, listen to us. And today, you took time out of your schedules to come here and develop bridges between the elders of our city and that body that's going to create the laws to address some of the issues we're talking to you today and we'll be continuing to talk to you in the future, I hope. One of two topics that we would like to bring to you today to at least begin the discussion is the issue of panhandling. More and more panhandlers are being visible all over the city. Not only are they just men, but I and others have seen young women, elderly women, uh, some are even recruiting little children to go and panhandle. And that creates a vulnerability for, for us senior citizens because some folk really come at us, much like the uh, windshield wiper folks will come at the drivers and won't leave the car unless you give them a few dollars or they insist, they insist on washing your <coughs> windshields. The same thing they do to the seniors. And Owen would like to give you some specifics on what he experiences with some recommendations. My name is Owen Redwood, and I am a resident of your, oh, I am a resident of your ward, uh, Alderman Burnett. Right at Division and Clark, you cannot walk out of Jewels without three or four people standing by asking you for change, change they don't want. They want dollar bills. And if you tell them no, they give you all the abusive language that you can hear. And you just, I want to know, how could you, not you, but how could we stop that? Well, one, one uh, I would talk to the commander about it. Uh, and two, we would try and talk to Jules about it to see if they can keep them off of their property. Uh, you know, of course, so you, where you stay at, uh, 116 Elm? Do you stay in the 116 Elm building? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I just, I just got you all in my map. Yes. So you're new to my ward. Uh, that Jules happened to not be in my ward, but, but it's in the same police district that represents you and other areas in our ward. So we can talk to the commander about it. So I would talk to the commander about it. And also I would relay, I would relay this to the alderman whose ward that is, uh, which is Brandon Rowley, and see if we can work on that together. So tell me this, and, and I want to ask this. Um, are some of those panhandlers from your building? It's a possibility. I couldn't okay. tell you. I don't know them by name. All right. But it's a possibility. OK. All right. Yeah, I used to live over there on, on uh, Elm and LaSalle. I used to live in that area, so mm -hmm. I know that those kind of things um, has been going on over in that area for a long time. Yes. Right. So we'll see what we can do, though. Okay? okay. I didn't know that they were harassing the seniors like that. Um, so we'll see what we can do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in, in our neighborhood, some are even coming to the houses and knocking on the door oh. and, and asking if they can wash windows. Oh and that's rather threatening because they have an instrument in their hand to break a window if you choose not to have them wash the window. Mm. Although it's, it's implied, it's never directly stated. And so that's also occurring. A, a, a second issue and a final issue for our group 
in terms of our vulnerability is that we are now being confronted by these flash mobs. I mean, uh, elderly will be just walking in Target and the next minute they know 20, 30 young people come running in, push them aside, take the materials and run out. Some folks try to get on public transportation to get out, yet we are finding that there's a big difference in the way we're treated on CTA transportation versus PACE. So Ms. Donna and Ms. Minnie would like to share with you how we're not treated well on CTA at some times versus PACE. Hello, I'm Minnie Booker and I live in the fourth ward. And um, sometimes when you get on the bus, uh, when I go to church, I go north of LaSalle. And the young people, they say for uh, seniors and handicapped, they just sit there, they, they roll their eyes at you like you committed a crime. And you know, and so, and then another elderly will offer me a seat. You know, it's, it's, it's really a sad thing. Are you waiting for the bus, the bus stop, the young men will jump on the bus in front of you. And you just stand there and look, look and you say, well, okay, well, I'll get on after you. So there's no respect, you know, but I, it's, it's, it's a sad thing. Then I'd also like to, uh, Natalie Kimmons called me. They've already talked about the, uh, the uh, cracks in the sidewalks. But I'd just like to mention that she had fall, had a fall, and uh, she really wanted us to uh, mention that LaSalle and Elm has uh, a lot of cracks in the sidewalk. So and she said quite a few people have fallen there. So where, where are LaSalle and Elm? La LaSalle and Elm. I know, but there's four corners. Um, you, yeah, we'll, we'll look at it, but I just need to, to okay, let you know also. Uh, so, so one of those corners is not our ward. <laughs> so that's why I asked who's, you know, what, what corner it is. So, because you know, these maps, they like all over the place. So, um, so I wouldn't have the authority to do anything on one of those corners, which is actually the uh, southwest corner. The southwest corner of LaSalle and Elm is not ours, right? But the other three corners are. So we'll look at it. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about the CTA. I have to use a walker now, and I know when I was first using the walker, I got on the CTA, and I know I wasn't very welcome on the CTA as far as the bus driver and the park passengers because the aisles are narrow, and some of these people getting on the bus do not look where they're going. They would bump into the walker, and naturally they didn't like it. And I didn't like riding on there either because the aisles were small, and I can't get on, I can't pull up on the bus because of the steps. So I started to get the pace ride now, but I have to re use the pace ride for everywhere I go. And it's not always convenient because you have to wait for them. They say they'll come at a certain time. They don't come. You wait and wait and wait. So it sounds like you all have a lot of concern with CTA. Mm -hmm. If I may make a suggestion, yeah. um, if you can give, give us all of the things that you mm -hmm. have from CTA, we can compose a letter with all of our names on it. So in each of, and we can write. CTA and let them know that we got this from this meeting, I would meeting with you all and send it to the, uh, the president of CTA and, and hopefully we can get a response. Like, you know, I will go a little bit further and we'll suggest that if you want, uh, uh, I could try to help to bring the CTA to, to come here to have a meeting with you so that they can hear from you exactly what are the concerns that, that you have expressed to us in, in a more extensive way, hopefully with more of your members here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very thankful. 
So I will suggest that you give us several dates I, into the next a few months, and then we can reach out to the CTA and make that happen. So you're taking me. So we're just about um, coming up on the hour here, and we agreed to keep this um, to an hour. And uh, I just wondered, is there any other question or issue that anybody from the Civic Engagement or the Elder Advisory Committee wanted to raise while we have the attention of the Alderman? And mine too. You? Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. It's an unpleasant question, and it's frightening. There are many, many individuals on the north side and probably in any large community in the city with guns. You can hear the pop shots all night long. And I can't think of any way that in our area, the 48th Ward, which is right off Lincoln Park, that one can take any individual action or even a community action. Is there anything that's percolating in anyone's head that we can contribute to for some measure of safety when it comes to walking the dog after nine o'clock? It's not easy. And I don't think it's easy for you to even answer the question but it's a relevant one every single day. The, the only thing that I can say is that we just need to continue to get more engaged. Uh, those of you who can go <coughs> to CAP meetings, go to CAP meetings. Uh, make sure you report everything that's going on because it usually gets on the police radar screen when they have roll call. Uh, and try to encourage your neighbors to come to CAP's meetings also. Uh, and then, um, and, and, and I understand when you guys talk about how the young people treat you on the buses and all of those things, you know, uh, I remember when I was young and, and there were seniors in the neighborhood, they would whoop me if I did something <laughs> wrong. Um, but, you know, but I, but I think we, and, and I know it's very challenging for you all, but, but I think we, we need to at least say something to these young people, get them a, a look like, you know, that's not good, or would you do that to your grandmother, or, you know, I don't know. I don't they want do to tell you. They do talk to their grandmother like that. They do talk to their grandmother yeah. like that? Well, that's too bad. So, well, so I don't know, maybe, don't we need, maybe, maybe we need to get more involved with volunteering with these kids and become their grandmothers, because, you know, uh, that's our society is, is sort of lost. You know, we have a lost society. Uh, a lost, I shouldn't say a lost society, a lost generation of young people uh, today that, that don't know how to respect their elders or even respect their own parents. So, you know, that's a bigger, that's a bigger challenge that we, we all got to figure out how to do it's it. It's a challenge. You know, and, and sadly, um, we're talking about a minority of, among the universe of uh, youth uh, that really are out of control and the disrespectful not only to our seniors but to their parents Teachers and among parents. themselves uh, yeah so um, you know one of the things that I um, do in my ward I have a monthly meeting with all the commanders that touch the, my ward um, and so to those meetings I not only invite um, them but I also mm -hmm. invite um, um, CHA um, that, that owns housing in my ward and also the other affordable housing uh, uh, leaders or executives, you know, that manage or own property in my ward. But I also invite, um, we also invite uh, residents uh, from our ward that has given us complaints uh, pertaining to public safety, any matter that have to do with public safety. In fact, you know, this morning we had uh, our monthly commander's meeting and we started that, that about almost three years ago and it has been very, very effective because the commanders hear uh, firsthand from our constituents um, about their challenges that they're facing, ongoing challenges, because most of these um, residents also go to the CAPS meetings. And after a year, year and a half, you still the same problems exist in those neighborhoods. And so 
I mean, that's something that has worked for us um, mm -hmm. very effectively, not by my own accounts, but by the accounts of our residents that participate in these meetings. I think you know, the, the, there is a one old um, technique that a lot of people have used for um, community groups and, and block clubs have used for many years, and those are the phone trees. Still today, uh, the police rely on the how many calls pertaining to a given area or to a given address have been made uh, to make those properties, those addresses a priority uh, for them to pay more attention to them. And so if you meet <clears throat> with a commander or police officer and you tell them, this house is a problem, uh, it's a constant drug dealing or, or, or gang bangers hanging out there, and they look at their 911 calls and they said, we have only received one call for that property in the last three months. I mean, and so they're statistically driven to be able to pay attention to problematic properties. So the phone tree among some of your neighbors uh, uh, helps because every time that something happens, if you see it, you call 911 and then you tell your next in line in your phone tree, I saw this happening, call 911, and so on and so forth. That works. Yeah, uh, it's, tedious, it's, it's tedious, but it does work. And it doesn't work overnight, no. but it does work over time. So I'm going to bring this to a close, and I wanted to just say thank you to the aldermen for, first of all, um, giving us your time. I think it's good for a round of applause. And uh, it's also important to know um, that every one of the aldermen were invited. You saw something that was important to come and listen, and that means the world of difference. Um, if we're all fortunate, we'll live to be in our 70s and 80s and 90s. And one of the things that we learn at Little Brothers is, is that nobody plans to grow old alone. It sort of happens. And, you know, you can have children, you can have a whole life, and something happens and things change. And so it's really important that those of us that are in positions to um, bring people together, to have dialogue, to try to begin to peck away at some of these issues, do so. So our hat's off for you for doing that today. And so um, I also want to thank the members of the Elder Advisory Committee and Civic Engagement Committee that have worked so hard in putting this together. Um, they were very thoughtful in their comments and respectful of your time. And I think you've given us a, a lot of really good recommendations to follow up on. And believe me, this group will. So I'm just going to hand it over to Robin and Francis, who just want to formally say um, close today's session, and uh, then we will adjourn for lunch. So Robin and Francis. Thank you. My, I'm losing my voice. <laughs> Gentlemen, I am truly grateful for your being here. I think we all are, and we are looking forward to it a broadening exchange of ideas among you and your fellow alder people and ourselves because we're not going to go away and you're not going to go away so you'll hear from us again and we'll hear from you thank you very much for hearing from us today thank you thank you we we uh sincerely appreciate all the information that you gave us and we are so happy that you took the time to come by and visit the seniors because sometimes the seniors feel kind of like left out because you know but anyway we, we really really appreciate you taking up the time to come and listen to our problems and uh, giving us information on the problems that we have and we thank you for taking the t for going to uh, the CTA and other doing other things in order to help us. Okay. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you.